Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Today is May 27th, 2021. Welcome to my show, My Turn to Talk. I am Salat Lou's sister. And today's show um, was actually supposed to be yesterday's show, so I'm, I'm getting back on track here. Um, today, I want to talk about uh, Karen's and how they um, have affected um, this, this country and um, how they have affected uh, citizens of this country and um, also the mindset of this country. Now, a lot of people know, you know, um, about Central Park Karen and, um, you know, barbecue Becky and, you know, what have you, but um, Karen actually, um, or Karens, I should say, um, actually go back to the antebellum um, time during slavery. And Karens weren't called Karens then, they were called Miss Anne's. And growing up, um, you know, in in black culture, for in some families, you know, your mom or your grandmother may say, you know, don't act like a Miss Ann. You know, um, and that was the term um, that was given, you know, during the Elta, excuse me, antebellum um, period. So. Uh, Karens have been around for um, a long time, and they have uh, affected the way people react, um, how people are seen because of what they do and what they say, um, which is usually an untruth. Um, so I am going to share with you, let me get started here. Okay, and I am going to share, let me get rid of this. All right, so we have Miss Ann, all right? So it says originated in antebellum era, 1815 to 1861. I think um, Miss Ann goes into the um, 20th century, probably um, uh, through to civil rights. Um, but basically, um, what this is saying is Miss Ann is slain for a white woman who is aware of her whiteness and the status it conveys and is complicit with the system that preserves that status. She may or may not own enslaved people, but she definitely knows what the hierarchy is and usually does not challenge it. And they refer to Scarlett O'Hara, Gone with the Wind. Then we have Becky. Becky is slain for a white woman who is happily... Uh, ignorant and unaware of her whiteness, but is complicit with the system that upholds her status. So we have one that preserves the status and another one that upholds the status. Becky is often overly dramatic when confronted about her whiteness. She may or may not be a valley girl. Now, when we talk about um, uh, Karen's, um, or I, I'm sorry, when we talk about Becky's, um, Becky could be that person, you know, who is uh, in your sorority, um, who really wants to hang out, you know, with black people. Um, but more than likely, she's not going to invite you into her sorority, okay? On the other hand, on the other hand, to be fair, we do have Black Karens. 
we do have black Karens. We have uh, Karens who may hang out with, you know, white girls, Caucasian girls, um, but they're not going to invite them into their sorority or, you know, I'll hang out with you, but you can't come over here. You know, yes, we definitely have black Karens. So uh, to be fair. So then we just have Karen. Okay, Karen is shorthand again for a woman who is usually white. She's convinced her way is the right, right way, whether it's about charcoal grilling in the park, policing non-white people's behavior, or demanding to speak to a manager or higher authority who can get her what she wants. She's the kind of person who posts on next door about a suspicious looking person walking around her neighborhood or demands to be let into a grocery store without wearing a mask. So um, these are the type of Karens um, that are out there. So we have Miss Ann, we have Becky, and we have Karen. And once again, I want to say that there are um, Asian Karens. Uh, there was an incident, um, uh, I do believe last week, where an Asian woman um, was trolling a white man who was walking his dog and she kicked his dog and, you know, tried to take his dog and demanded where he was going and what he was doing. You know, we have um, Asian Karens. Um, you know, we have Asian Karens when African Americans, you know, go into their stores, you know, they're ready to call the police that, you know, this black person is about to, you know, steal from me, you know, whatever. Um, uh, and again, we have Hispanic Karens, you know, who, who demand, you know, um, who bang on doors and de demand Wi-Fi, you know, passwords, uh, you know, um, and we have Black Karens who go into stores and, you know, um, you know, they, you know, demand to get you know, particular items, you know, in the store, this isn't good enough, or, you know, who, who do you think you're talking to, whatever. Karen's come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. But the Karen's that who have made an impact on history and who have caused harm are usually white Karen's. So I'm going to take this down and I am going to put up one of the most famous Karens. Let me get this. And this Karen is, excuse me, here we go. Let me bring this down. Carolyn and Roy Bryant. Okay. Carolyn Bryant is the woman who um, accused Emmett Till of um, whistling at her, touching her, you know, making lewd comments um, to her. And what she testified in court was, you know, I can't repeat the name that he called me because it's, you know, too nasty to say. She couldn't repeat it because Emmett Till never said it. Uh, because Emmett Till never did what she said that he did. But this is uh, Carolyn Bryant. And she um, was responsible for this. Carolyn Bryant was responsible for the beating, torture, and lynching of Emmett Till. So she's probably the most famous Karen out there, or she's one of the most famous, you know, out there. And um, 
as everyone knows, who knows the story, uh, Emmett Till's mother, Mamie Till, insisted on an open casket funeral for Emmett to show the world what racism did to her young son. She wanted the world to see. And I applaud her for this. I applaud her that this young man, 14 years old, you know, was cut down and brutally murdered because of a lie. And, um, you know, is absolutely um, heartbreaking. So here we have his mother, Mamie Till, at his funeral. You know, um, she's heartbroken. So 14 year old who allegedly winked at a white woman at a local store and was dragged out of his great uncle's home in the middle of the night, beaten, shot, and waded to the bottom of the Tallahatchie River. Till's mother insisted on an open casket to show the injustice to all the world. Can you imagine, can you imagine if your child, you send your child to a relative's house for the summer, you know, um, Emmett was from Chicago, he was from the North. And his mother gave him the talk about what not to do. You know, what not to do when you're around white people, especially white people in the South. And um, again, he allegedly, but we know that's not true. We know that's not true. But can you imagine that you send, again, you send your child, you know, to, to summer camp or, you know, wherever, and you're expecting, you know, to meet them at the bus stop or the airport, whatever, to greet them when they come home and they come home in a box. They come home looking like this because of this woman, Carolyn Bryant. Her lie and this man who was one of three who killed Emmett Till. Okay, so then we have the viewing of Emmett Till's body. You know, thousands of people showed up at that Chicago church on the south side to see what racism did to Mamie Till's son. Now, This was Carolyn Bryant about 40 years later. And she, um, admitted to lying about Emma Till. She admitted that she lied because she wanted her husband, Roy, to be acquitted of his murder. Now, I don't know if Roy and the other two, you know, threaten her, you know, you better do this, you know, or else, um, or if she just did it on her own. But the fact that, you know, she lied to keep her husband from going to prison for, uh, you know, heinous, you know, murder, You know, I mean, this is how Black people were usually found in the South, you know, back in the 50s, 40s, 30s, you know, even now, you know, um, and there are stories of lynchings now, 
you know, but this woman was able to live out her life. I do believe she was around 83 years old when um, uh, 60 Minutes did this story on her. She was 83. Emma Till was 14. Who had the better life? Who was able to live out their lives? So to me, you know, this is a misand. This is a misand. Okay, so take these down and let's talk about Claude Neal. Claude Neal was 23 years old and he was um, killed, murdered on October 26, 1934. And as you can see, um, well, I'll, I'll read this. Claude Neal's lynching death placed a national spotlight on Mariana, Florida. He was grabbed from a jail cell in Bruton, Alabama, where six men had created a diversion to distract the sheriff in charge of his custody. The six men tortured and killed him in a wooded area in Greenwood, Florida, near the home of the girl he was accused of raping and killing. Claude's dead body was then brought to the home where reportedly the father of Lola Canada. Um, that was the girl that was found dead, shot Claude's body. After the torture and shooting, his body was taken to the town square in Mariana, Florida and hung from a tree to deliver a message. The message was, don't cross the line. He was 23 years old, Claude Neal was 23 years old, married and the father of a three-year-old daughter, Allie Mae, his wife was expecting another baby, but that pregnancy did not survive the attempt to escape with Allie Mae. Little information as to what event occurred uh, caused, ultimately caused the harm. Mrs. Neal's pregnancy is known. So Claude Neal wasn't lynched in terms of he was alive, they put a rope around his neck and he lynched him and they lynched him. They tortured and killed him, then took him to the father of this white woman who was killed, where he proceeds to mutilate the, the body, and then they're going to hang his body. Okay, and... Um, And I am showing these, these, these pictures. I mean, anyone can see these pictures, but this was Claude Neal. So after you do all this, you still, you know, lynch him and put him on display. So onlookers can see. Now, there were two things that they did to Claude Neal. They lynched him from a tree. But the first time, they took him to the courthouse. And they hung him nearby at the courthouse so people could see. And then they took him, you know, stripped him of his clothes, and they Put him here. All because he was accused of killing and raping a white woman who, um, whose death was never proven and the sheriff thought 
that it was possible a white man was the one who bludgeoned Lola Canada and left her body in a field. And the field just happened to be close to where Claude Neal lived and also worked. Now there's something that's interesting about Claude Neal and you know everything that that um, everything that happened with him. Claude Neal, um, he was seized by this Florida mob. Here's the, the head headline. Um, but it was never proven that he did anything. And when they took when they took Claude Neal's body and hung him near the courthouse, hundreds of white people came to, to see this. They came to look at this. They came to see this spectacle. When the sheriff finally got around to, um, you know, trying to get things under control, he took Claude's body down, the, the sheriff did, and buried him. Other white people in the town of Mariana, Florida, wanted to see Claude Neal hanging in this place close to the courthouse. And when they saw that Claude Neal's body was gone, um, people had already taken pictures and what have you, and they were um, uh, going to make them into postcards because back then that's what mobs like this did. They lynched someone, killed some, killed a black person, whatever, burned them, whatever. They would make postcards. And the mob demanded the sheriff. The mob demanded the sheriff dig Claude Neal's body up and hang him again so people could see this man hanging from this tree. The sheriff refused, and this started, this chain of events started the Mariana race riots. And so since Claude Neal wasn't available, his body wasn't available for them to, 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 to you know, look at and, and, you know, torture and beat some more and, and mutilate some more they decided let's go get some live black people. And they started to go into the black areas of Mariana and they started to beat and torture black people. And about uh, 200 uh, black citizens of Florida were attacked that day. So this is what mob mentality does. You get one or two people to get something going and everybody else just follows along. All right. Let's talk about Tulsa for a moment. And um, the 100th anniversary of Tulsa is um, coming up uh, next month. OK, so here you have an article um, where a um, Black man by the name of um, Dick Rowland You see, hopped on an elevator that was occupied by a white woman, Sarah Page. Page screamed, 
Roland, being black in a time of heated race contention, ran away. He was later arrested that night for sexual assault. When Roland, when Dick Roland was getting on this elevator with this white woman, what he did was trip over her foot. He tripped over her foot. She screams. She then goes back and says, this black man tried to attack me, which then turns into sexual assault. And Dick Rowland is arrested. So after that, things get a little foggy in terms of what went on in Tulsa and exactly, you know, what went from Dick Rowland to burning down an entire neighborhood of Black people in about 16 hours. Everything's gone. Sarah Page later, we find out, dropped her charges. I made a mistake. That didn't happen. Dick Rowland was released and he left town that same day. He left town. And some people think he left town before all the murders be, began. But once again, this Karen, this Miss Ann, caused not just the death of one Black person, but of hundreds. And the destruction, the destruction of an entire neighborhood where Black people worked hard to build up something that was good. All right. Let's talk about Rosewood. Rosewood is another massacre that happened in less than hours, you know, over a 12 hour period, you have a community of black people that was just utterly destroyed over the lie of another Miss Ann. You have a white woman who was cheating on her husband with another white man, having an affair. Her husband was about to catch them. The white man she's fooling around with jumps up, runs out the house. Husband comes in, sees something's going on. Somebody was in this bed and it wasn't me. So she blames a black man. What did this black man look like? Oh, I don't know, he, he was black. Okay, let's go get all the black men. Let's start rounding them all up. But it didn't stop there. Again, we have this mob mentality where you have Miss Ann who gets offended <laughs> and um, she causes this chain reaction where an entire town is gone, destroyed, because Miss Ann, you know, she um, she uh, didn't want to get caught fooling around. So an entire town of Rosewood is destroyed. But what's interesting about Rosewood that I uh, recently found out 
is remember these homes were owned by black people or as we were called back then colored and what the good people of rosewood the good white people of rosewood what they did was after this town was you know everybody all the black people in rosewood you know if they weren't killed then then they fleed you know they ran they had to you know they're out they're hiding you know they can't go back to their homes so what the good people of rosewood did they went in and any homes that were left they looted they stole and they declared that no black person will ever own land in rosewood they took that land they confiscated that land and they said no other um no black person will ever own land in, in rosewood and for a while that was the way it was until black people who were the descendants of these people in Rosewood went back and said, no, this is our land. This was my grandmother's house. This was my great aunt's house. This is our land and we want it back. But it was destroyed because of a lie from a Miss Anne. You know, so you look at these Beckys and um, uh, these Karens and these Missans, and that's when I go, why? Why would you purposely lie about something that you know could not only cause someone harm physically, but it could also kill them. And I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't understand that. To purposely lie knowing that you're going to more than likely cause someone to be harmed, if at the least go to jail, be, be arrested. Now, the Central Park Karen, who, um, you know, purposely called on uh, Christopher Cooper, um, you know, to pick up your phone and look this man in his eye and say, I'm going to call and say, I'm being attacked by an African-American man, black man to purposely look at him and say, I'm going to say this as she's walking towards him, you know, or you have the Karen, you know, who doesn't want to let the, the, um, uh, uh, I think she's key, key fob Karen, whatever, doesn't want to let him, you know, in his own building. How do I know you live here? You know, you know, what apartment do you live in? Prove it. And he's, you know, he's like, I don't have to prove anything to you. No, he, he doesn't. You know, I don't feel safe. So when she finally gets in, she doesn't, he doesn't feel safe, but she gets on the elevator with him. She follows him to his floor. She follows him to his apartment. And she still wants to call the police on someone who she doesn't think belongs in her building. I mean, I mean, it's it's just crazy, you know. And to me, Karens are evolving, you know, um, into mob mentality, you know. And you know, it's it, it just. 
you know, the things that they complain about shows how much they truly believe they're entitled. Entitled to what? You know, I'm, you know, you have barbecue Becky. I'm minding my own business, trying to have a nice outing with my family and my friends, you know, not paying you or anyone else attention. And you have to ruin that. If I'm breaking the law, a police officer would come by and they would say something. I don't need you to police me and tell me what I should or should not do. I don't need you to tell me that I should not, you know, who am I to write or stencil in front of my own apartment building? And then you lie and say, well, I know the people who live here. No, you don't, because I live here. You don't know me. I don't know you. <laughs> you know? I mean, who are you? I mean, it, it just, I mean, it just, it just doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, who, who are you to, to tell me that I can't take pictures in a park with, with my, you know, husband and my child? I'm trying to take one-year-old birthday pictures. And you're, you know, telling me to, to get out. You don't belong here. It's a public park. You just don't want me in this particular park. You know, I mean, it, it, it just doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make any sense to me. You know, um, and all Karen's do or Miss Ann's and Becky's do is they perpetuate stereotypes and they make the divisiveness in this country grow larger and larger and larger. I mean, it's like the chasm will never close because somebody like a Karen or a Becky or Miss Ann is constantly saying or doing things that um, won't allow healing to happen. What do you do? I mean, I'm pretty sure we all know some Karens. I, I know some Black Karens, and I also know white Karens, you know. But um, if you look back in history, usually when a Karen did something, it was usually to save themselves. You know, when you have a um, Carolyn Bryant, that was to save herself. That was to save her family, to save her husband. But what did it do to Mamie Teal? I mean, that was her only child. What did it do to Mamie Till? I mean, you have this woman who, you know, is just grieving. Let me do this again. Okay, there we go. You have this woman who is just grieving. And um, heartbroken over the murder of her son, yet she's strong enough to allow an open casket so the world can see.
all because somebody lied. And this woman kept this lie. I mean, people knew then that that Carolyn Bryant was lying. The white folks at the trial knew that Carolyn Bryant was lying. You know, but um, to stay silent, you know, for almost 40 or 50 years, she should have been arrested. Because she, because she lied on the stand. She should have been arrested. She should have been put in, in, in jail. Again, Carolyn Bryant, she lived her life. But Emmett Till's life was cut short because she lied. Why did you lie in the first place? Why would you even say that this boy did this to you when he never did? He never said anything to you. And she ad admits that. You know, except for, yes, ma'am. But this boy was supposed to spend the summer with his uncle and the rest of his family and have a fun filled summer in the South, in 1955, being black, and then go home to Chicago with his mother, back to his mother. I mean, again, I say, can you imagine the heartbreak of this woman? There are many, many more Claude Neils out there. There are many more, you know, uh, Dick Rollins. Um, Emmett Till's. And a lot of them are not because of Karen's. You know, I, um, you know, it, 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 it breaks my heart when I, you know, see things like this and you read and you read about them and then, you know, you read sometime later that these people, I'm sorry. That didn't happen. I am so sorry. But that family, what that family went, went through, what that family went through, what you put that family through. You know, um, when I did the show on the uh, Central Park Five, I'm sorry, the, um, the, the Little Rock Nine, Central Park Five, that's another show. Um, on the Little Rock Nine, you know, you have people who years later um, came and apologized and said, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry I treated you like that. I'm sorry that um, I said that. Um, yeah, you can appreciate the, the apology, but a lot of people who went through civil rights had PTSD. You know, I mean, John Lewis talked about the psychological effects that those marches and, you know, just living in, in, in a state or town that was just so racist and oppressive. So imagine being in a situation where at the drop of a hat, someone can say, 
this black person is doing this, not, oh, you know, you're in, in the park, you know, I'm being assaulted by a man. I'm being, or, or this family is, is barbecuing. It's this black family, this black man, this black woman. I don't know. But at the same time, again, to be fair, we have, you know, you have the, they say the Kins and Karens, we have black, black Kins. You know, we have, you know, uh, black men who have um, been violent towards Asians who, you know, decide that, you know, an, an Asian person is walking down the street that they want to beat them up. That they, you know, want to push them down or shove them down, you know, where, you know, these elderly Asian people, you know, um, are seriously hurt. You know, and to them, I say, why? You know, so when your actions cause bodily harm to someone, it's a problem. When you intentionally do something where your actions are physically hurting someone, there's a problem. And, um, I don't know. This summer is going to be very interesting to me. And um, I don't know if we'll have more protests. Um, if we do, I hope that they are peaceful. But for me, when 2021 started for me it was like just I was holding my breath for four and a half years you finally release it and okay we're starting off new everything's going to be better you know whatever which I think it is um but then January 6th happened and January 6th kind of set the stage at least to me January 6th kind of set the stage for how 2021 was, was going to, to turn out. You know, now we have all kinds of crazy laws and you know, um, people saying and doing things that um, they know is wrong you know, with these voter laws and, and what have you. Um, uh, but this is also a year that you know, we're coming out of a, a pandemic. Uh, more and more people are being vaccinated where masks, you know, are starting to come off. Um, and we are trying to get back to some type of normal, you know, living. For me, I'm still wearing a mask. I'm still wearing my gloves. You know, I will be doing that for a while, you know, but you know, the, the Karens and the Mizans and, and, and the Beckys, you know, um, you have to stop. And I say that on both sides. You have, like I said, your, your, your Black Karens, your Asian Karens, you know, it has to stop. You know, uh, Christopher Cooper in, in, in Central Park was extremely lucky. God shielded him that, that day. God was like, this is, he's not going to be harmed. I got you. But then again, I believe God had George Floyd. I believe God was with George Floyd as his, you know, life was ebbing out of his body. And I do believe that you know, God said, whispered in, in, in George Floyd's ear, I have plans for you. 
you're going to do great things. And he has. You're going to force change. You know, I believe that we're all put here for a reason. I believe that um, people cross paths for a reason. Darnella Frazier was going to cup foods with her little cousin on that particular day at that particular time because God had a plan for her. And she fulfilled that plan. So every time, you know, you have a Karen out there who wants to purposely pick up the phone and make a phone call. You know, think twice. Because you are harming someone. You know, but the person you're causing harm to, they are affecting change. They are. I mean, with what Emmett Till went through, for him to die the way that he did, alone. But once again, you know, as odd or as crazy as it may sound, you know, um, if you ever looked at, you know, um, Touched by an Angel, the show, T Touched by an Angel, and you had Andrew, who was the um, angel of death, and whenever someone died, and Andrew was there with them. You know, I do believe that the angel of death, that there was an Andrew who was with Emmett Till, who was also telling him, you are going to make a change. God has a plan for you. This is why you're here. And his mother, you know, went on to affect change. She became an, an, an activist and she did that until the day she died. You know, same thing with Martin Luther King. You know, people are here for a reason. People cross your paths in life for a reason. So, you know, you Karens and Miss, Miss Anns and Beckys out there, when you do things, you know, and you're doing them with um, an evil heart that's going to cause harm to someone. Not only are you causing harm to them, but you are, you know, again, this may sound crazy, you are allowing them to affect change. Um, I know when I look back at my own history, um, my father's family comes from Alabama and um, going back and tracing um, his family, um, there were lynchings. People in my family were lynched. You know, I'm pretty sure many of us have stories like this to tell. Um, but um, when you have someone who purposely, you know, again, I go back to Carolyn Bryant and, you know, this, this secret she held for over 40 years. So your husband wouldn't go to jail because he was supposedly protecting you because you said that not only did this black boy whistle at you, he also said a word that you just can't repeat because he never said it. So that's all I have. 
Um, but again, you know, I just, you know, want to say that um, people know Karens. Karens are the ones that, you know, whisper stuff to other people. And they cause harm to other people. And they get their little mob together. And it grows, the mob grows. Sometimes that mob turns into a Claude Neal mob where people are murdered and beaten and their homes are burned down. Or sometimes that mob is just a display of words. But there are Karens out there. There's Miss Ann's, there are Becky's, and there are Karens. And unfortunately, this is the world and time that we continue to live in. But what are you going to do? So that's all I have today. Thank you for joining me. And um, tomorrow I'm going to be talking about Native Americans because um, some very interesting um, things that have gone on with Native uh, Americans. And if anyone should have reparations in this country before anyone, you know, and it may cost billions, but the Native Americans, yeah. But that's what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow. But anyway, thank you so much. I'm a little ahead of my hour, but that's okay. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Great show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will see you later. Bye. <laughs>